Hey, this is Rob Hockman, and you're watching Perched on a Top Rope, and it's me, it's me, it's the ROB talking nothing but wrestling. Welcome, everyone, to Perched on the Top Rope. It's me, it's me, it's the Long Island Iced Lee. And as you heard from that show opener, ladies and gentlemen, we have former WWF WWE creative writer Rob Hockman. Rob, how you doing today? I am awesome. How the heck are you? I, I'm doing fantastic. We're sitting here at my Hasbro bar, just hanging out, having a good time. Rob, break this down real fast. I've, I've watched a lot of interviews that you've done. Um, yep. Graduate from Seton Hall. While you're in Seton Hall, you actually did your uh, first indie show. Is that yep. correct? And, yep. um, you know, so right away, uh, you're using your degree, which everybody it was, it was in sports management. Uh, so how did it like, you literally like in the wrestling industry went from like zero to 100 real quick. What did what did that show teach you about the industry? Well, we, we went from zero to, to probably 75. We did a little U-turn, took a little detour, and then we went uh, 100 miles an hour. Um, to back up a little bit, when I was at Seton Hall University, I was in charge of um, putting different trips together for all the students of the university and the faculty. Uh, we used to, since Seton Hall is relatively close to the, tri the Meadowlands Arena, Madison Square Garden, we would take bus trips to see things like the Rangers, the Knicks, WWF at the time, WWE. Um, but when they, when they exploded, um, the, the ability to buy bulk tickets basically became non-existent. Um, so a friend of mine who had been working um, in the, in the independent business, uh, Carmine Sabia, along with Tommy Fierro, uh, who used to work with the NWA, uh, suggested that we do a show at the school where if w you can't go to WWF, we'll bring WWF to you. Um, and we basically, the three heads came together and we put it together. We had, it wasn't what you might consider a big show, but we had, uh, King Kong Bundy on it. We had Iron Sheik. We had Tito Santana. We had Crowbar from WCW. We had Low Key. We had Charlie Haas. Uh, we had Russ Haas. Uh, trying to think, and I and, and if I'm, uh, did I say Iron Sheik? Um, yeah, I mean that was it was a pretty well stacked card um, for that given time. Um, you know, and and when it was over, it was King Kong Bundy who had actually said, um, you did really, really well with this. What would you think about working in Connecticut? And I laughed it off and said, sure, I'd, I'd love to. But, you know, how's that ever going to happen? And he actually, little did I know, went home and and made a phone call um, to Connecticut. And after I, after I graduated or right before I graduated Seton Hall, I started working in public relations with the New York Giants. So that's where the detour went off. Um, and I did several years with, with the vice president of the New York Giants. Um, and by that time, Vince had actually tracked down my boss, Pat Hanlon, and had hounded him because I was actually ignoring Pat, uh, ignoring Vince rather, and, and wanting to stick with the Giants. And Pat called me into his office one morning and said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to, I want to be a general manager of the Giants. I want to work with you. I want to do this. I want to do that. And he basically sat me down and explained to me, there would basically have to be 100 plus people that would have to die all at once in order for me to have that chance. And even if that happened, chances are they would go elsewhere, you know, to hire outside from other organizations. Um, it was just more of an experience thing. And he said, I've, I've gotten a phone call from Connecticut and I think you know what it is. And I said, yeah. And he said, so you have two choices. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. The easy way is you're gonna walk out and you're gonna go to Connecticut and you're gonna be phenomenal at what you do. The hard way is I'm gonna fire you right now and you're gonna go up to Connecticut and be phenomenal at what you do. And my whole thing was I wanted a Super Bowl ring and he promised me if the Giants, if and when the Giants won the Super Bowl down the road, which 2007, when they beat the undefeated Patriots, I would get that Super Bowl ring and I do have that Super Bowl ring. And then we veered back on to, to Highway 95 and went up uh, to about exit seven uh, in Connecticut and, and off to the races. 
if I'm not mistaken, not only do you have the Super Bowl ring, but you also have, I, I'm, I apologize, I'm not that big of a football fan, but they were the AFC champions in 2000, correct? You have that ring as well. NFC champions, yep. 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 Okay, yep, yep. That's, uh, that's incredible, man. Um, I really like how it, you, the versatile you are with athletics, you can see in the background that you have with all the hockey and you know the football experience. You have a vast experience from commentary with Giants. You have it with currently right now doing it with Sonny Ono. Your time as a writer in WWF, WWE. Now what you're doing with Disney, even though that's that's not you know professional sports related, being a manager, being a promoter, doing all of these things, out of all of that, which has been to you the most rewarding? Oh, man. Yeah. Uh... Probably up until up until uh, Peacock got their hands on the network and decided to uh, override three quarters of the Attitude Era, um, working up there was phenomenal. Um, and I and and I also enjoyed um, after WWE took over WCW and purchased WCW, I actually wound up moving from New Jersey to uh, South Carolina to actually run a minor system for WWE, where we were fed talent such as Dusty Rhodes, Terry Funk, guys like that to actually help boost the younger guys. Um, and we would bring the younger guys in almost like what you would consider an NXT at this time. Um, and, and Dusty being one of the head guys for Stephanie, he would report back to her who she would obviously report back to Vince. And, you know, that, that was a lot of fun too. Cause, cause, um, you know, in doing that, I was able to to continue my relationships and my strong friendships with guys like Ron the Truth Killings, Jeff Jarrett, Road Dog Jesse James. Um, and also on a side note, shout out to him for getting better. I uh, didn't have that uh, massive heart attack that we thought at first. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, those two things were great. Uh, the Giants was phenomenal, but I, I, I always will have a soft spot in my heart for professional wrestling. Was that C4W that, that the, uh, the, the promotion? C4W was one of them. And then there was SCW, which was Southern Championship Wrestling, which was the one that I had with, uh, with Tony Collins, um, who works with Lone Star and uh, Hall & Oates now. Um, and we, that was where we had, we actually had Dusty Rhodes and Terry Funk's last match ever. It was inside of a steel cage in Conway high school, uh, where they, where Terry decided to light his branding iron on fire. He almost caught referee, Tony Hunter, who, uh, owns BTW, uh, big time wrestling, uh, which did a lot of huge shows with sting and guys like that. Um, he was the referee. Terry set him on fire. Uh, the ring caught on fire. It was, it was, it was a night of fun. And actually the, the undercard to that was uh, the new age outlaws and Jeff, Je uh, Jeff Hardy against the midnight express and myself, where I was actually Jim Cornette's nephew um, managing uh, the midnight express of Dennis Condry and Bobby. Eaton. So we had, when we put a show together, we didn't put it together with, uh, and I don't want this to sound bad, but we didn't put it together with a bunch of independent guys. We had pretty much six matches of, talent you had seen on tv and then maybe two or three that you, you you didn't know who they necessarily were and they were up and coming guys um back to back to kevin nash and, and big time wrestling last time i was at one of those shows kevin nash was there and i i interviewed him <laughs> and uh i heard you and him are pretty uh pretty pretty tight there <laughs> <laughs> we are we are i'm looking forward to seeing him next week down at wrestlecon um, and, and as long as he keeps the, uh, the Camus wine on his end of the hotel, uh, <laughs> we'll, we will be a okay. But other than that, I love Kevin. Uh, I miss him dearly. Uh, you know, this, this whole, uh, this whole COVID thing that we've got been going through for the past year, um, has really put a wrench in, in everybody getting together. You know, when we do these conventions and, and appearances and things like that, um, it's really more of like a, like a high school reunion or a college reunion, if you will, for all the boys, um, promoters and the wrestlers alike all enjoy getting together. Um, you know, not only meeting the fans, but also 
getting together with each other and sharing a drink, sharing some food uh, and talking about, you know, the good old days and, and what's to come. And this really has put a, a monkey wrench in it. And I'm so looking forward to going down to WrestleCon as well as uh, uh, WrestleFest, WrestleStock, uh, two conventions that are going to be phenomenal and off the charts down in Tampa. And then, of course, who can forget WrestleMania? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's 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 next week. You know, I, I'm looking forward to that week. I was going to go down to uh, WrestleMania, but, you know, still here in New York, they're they're pretty strict. So I'd have to uh, spend two weeks at home. Can't really afford to do that type deal, <laughs> you know, um, which sucks, but it is what it is. You made a lot of friends in the business early on, you know, Kevin Nash, Road Dog, Ron the Truth, Killings. While you were in WWE, was there ever an opportunity for you or other companies want you to go work for them in the wrestling industry? Yeah, um, right around, uh, let's say, 99. Uh, and I'm going to sound like Eric Bischoff here. 99 to 2000, right before everything went south for WCW. Um, we were in, the. I was doing some work for Turner Sports with the Goodwill Games. The Goodwill Games was actually 98 and short, and right after that ended. So it was right at the top of 99. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my vice president who reported to Harvey Schiller uh, brought me to Nassau Coliseum. And we sat down with Eric Bischoff who offered me a position to go work for them um, and complete the final year of my education from Seton Hall down at the University of Georgia. Um, I didn't want to leave my friends and my family and all the stuff that I had up, up north. So I turned it down. Um, obviously not knowing what was going to happen to WCW and all that stuff. Um, and Jeremy Borash actually wound up taking the, the, the position and becoming the Jeremy Borash that we know today. You, you, you've had experience with, you know, from Turner sports, you've had experience from WWF, WWE, Having a little experience with WCW, how could, how would, at the time, how would you compare the two companies? Oh, wow. Um, we had a, a WWE, WWF, we had a lot more structure. Um, there also wasn't as many hands in the pot or chefs in the kitchen as there are now. Um, you know, you had, you had four main guys and the, those four guys had their, their team underneath them, almost like a pyramid. Um, but even the team that was underneath them was not very much. Um, and we would sit together and put together our portions of the show. And then those, those main guys would go directly to Vince and, and, you know, put everything together. And unless they needed one of us for more clarification, um, you know, we had a lot more structure. WCW and, and guys have actually been on record saying it. They've, they almost wrote the show 30 minutes before, um, you know, they went live and, you know, a good friend of mine, Sonny Ono, who, by the way, I'm wearing his, his sweatshirt today. Um, he always used to say that, that they oftentimes they didn't know what they were going to do right up till eight o'clock when they went live or seven fifty seven when they went live. That's a really hard way of running a wrestling show. Um, when we were in WWE, we would actually go with, the initial run, what we were going to do. And we would actually, it would be our jobs to go into different corners of the arena and actually listen to the crowd and feel the fans and feel the energy. And if you felt the energy was shifting, then you knew we had to go a different way. And if you felt the energy was where we needed it to be, then you knew you were on to something. Um, but they, I don't think had their finger that well on the pulse. Um, you know, the guys who were at WCW and this ain't a knock on them, but you know, the Kevin Sullivan's of the world, they don't want to go out into the crowd and kind of listen to what was happening and listen to see if, if the crowd was shifting the younger guys that WWE had, they did, uh, you know, and, and, and no one knew who we were. Um, so when, if we went into a crowd and, and took an empty seat somewhere, um, and just were, were in, in, engulfing in the moment, uh, it wasn't like if you were sitting next to me, you knew who I was or what I was doing. Cause we took our passes off. We took our credentials off. We looked, we were wearing t-shirts. So we looked just like you were, you know, you were me in the crowd. Uh, 
So you never would have known the difference. Um, and I think that was a major, major difference for it. Um, the other problem was WWE went off the rails with, well, not off the rails, but were allowed to do whatever they wanted when it came to Steve Austin, DX, the Godfather. Um, you know, I think Kevin Nash in one of the, the, the videos I've seen him do when they document WCW and WWF, um, he was saying while, while Val Venus had Jenna Jameson going down on him on, on Monday Night Raw, they had standards and practices telling them they could barely have the Nitro girls on. So, you know, that 18 to 30 demographic was shifting majorly to WWE. You brought up a good point about listening to the fans and the reactions. I have been on WWE Thunderdome over 12 times from <laughs> Raw, SmackDown, and a couple of pay-per-views. Um, I've also been in trouble because I'm the guy who likes to take my Hasbros and put their face up in front of it. <laughs> I'm surprised they let you come back. Uh, me too. Uh, <laughs> Somebody's I, asleep at the wheel. I, I've actually um, have taken a photo every time I do it, and I actually have a tournament running on who was the best Hasbro that people saw. <laughs> um, so so back to the the you know listening to the fans and in in the audience reactions and everything wwe thunderdome when you're on and you're on the screen they're telling you who to cheer Kaboom. for who yep. to move for. Uh, uh, how do you feel about that you know knowing when you said you know you got to listen to the fans i went on the thunderdome one time mm -hmm. and uh when i went into it it was like when I was on, when I, John Stewart was a friend of mine. Uh, you know, he had the, the, the Daily Show and things like that. But long before he was John Stewart of the Daily Show, he had the John Stewart Show, which was a WWOR, shout out to New York, uh, late night talk show. And that was where John and I became friends. And I would go to his show and, and they would tape the show, same studio where they would tape Maury Povich. And the producer would come out and he would say, you know, we're going to have uh, Christina Applegate come out. And when she would start to walk out, he would say, all right, everybody cheer, cheer. Give me more cheers. Give me more cheers. Come on, more cheers, more cheers, louder, louder. And when I sat in the Thunderdome and in the headset, you're hearing the guy go, all right, we're going to need uh, cheers. Uh, Roman Reigns is coming out. Uh, loud cheers, please. Loud cheers. Louder, louder. Okay, here comes Seth Rollins. And everyone, give me your booze. Give me your booze. And I'm sitting there going, wait a minute, but what if I like Seth Rollins? You know, and at the time, and I, and, and at the time I actually liked Roman Reigns and they're like, all right, here comes Roman, boo for Roman. No, I, I, I kind of like him. Why can't I cheer for who I like and boo for who I don't like? Isn't that what made, isn't that why we went to professional wrestling live shows to begin with? And also on top of that, <sighs> It's a double-edged sword with, the, with the, the Thunderdome. And the reason it's a double-edged sword is because if you think back to when we had live crowds, Roman couldn't get his point across the way they wanted Roman to get his points across because the fans wouldn't shut up. And they, they, they wouldn't... There's the point that you can boo or you can cheer, but then you get to the point that you're obnoxious. And we weren't always obnoxious or the fans weren't always obnoxious in the attitude era. But now it's almost like if, if I don't get what I want, I'm just going to, to crap all over the product. And I think with the Thunderdome now and the closed set and the, and the piped in crowd noise, um, you're able to see the performer that Roman Reigns is and really can become. Um, I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed his heel work. I think it's some of his best work that he's ever done, but I think it's also because he's been able to get his point across. And that's from like the guy in your ear saying boo for Roman Reigns, whether you boo or you cheer, all they're seeing realistically on the screen is you going like this or you going like this. The crowd noise is pumped in. And when I went to the NXT uh, over at the Performance Center, which is just a few minutes from here, um, they, they pumped the noise in. Other than you banging on the, the plexiglass, yeah. they pumped the noise in. So it yep. could, they could care less whether you boo or cheer. Yeah, they just they got you doing this or this. Yeah. Uh, 
and, and I, I am a big fan of Roman's work right now because I was also a fan of his work when he was in Florida Championship Wrestling playing a heel. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just think the fans get tired of you wanting to push the face that you want to push and they don't want that person to be the John Cena now of the company with, you know, so then they do what they did with Hogan in the Royal rumble of what was it? 92 when Ric Flair won, mm-hmm. when he got eliminated, they booed him. Yeah. They, they started to get tired of the, the he's bigger than the company kind of type guy and, and always getting their way and everything. And, you know, Cena, the rock, all those guys have gotten to a point in their careers where they were so over, they were booed. We saw early on with the rock, uh, you know, uh, getting chance in 1996 of die Rocky die when he yep. was the continental champion, yep. you know? Um, so, I mean, it just, I guess, I don't know if it's how they're pushed by the company, but as the writer and, you know, you're writing some of this stuff, how does it feel to like, know that like you're giving some of your best work, but they're reacting the opposite way of how the company wants it's, it's definitely difficult. Um, but see, when we were, when I was there doing what I was doing, like I said before, you didn't really have too many people hijacking the show, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and thankfully, uh, some of the things I was involved in, like Crime Time, uh, because it was funny racy, silly, whatever you want to call it, the fans got behind it. So I didn't have as much problems as, you know, I can imagine some of the people, you know, like if we were in a live crowd and people were chanting CM Punk and, you know, let's, let's be honest, I'm going to ruin Christmas for everybody. He's not coming back. You can chant all you want. He's not coming back so you know and that's and that's a shout out to uh to tony khan as well he's not coming (laughs) back so uh that was you know other than that i mean you know you always knew when we went to long island nassau coliseum when we went to chicago when we went to philadelphia we knew we were in store for something um but it wasn't nearly as bad as 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 it's gotten um you know, uh, and, and again, I, I think now that people have seen Roman for the character that he is, I think more people now appreciate him. So I think now when we do go to, for example, WrestleMania this year, um, I think the people are going to boo him. Uh, I think they've put him in a great position to boo him. Um, I think they put Daniel Bryan, why he's in the match, I don't know. Um, I was doing an interview the other day about this and, and I feel they shoved too many people into WrestleMania and it's kind of lost its luster, but I feel they put Daniel Bryan in a position to get really, really cheered. Um, and edge is going to be that nostalgic guy that, that the older people are going to be like, man, I'm really pulling for that guy that I saw in the nineties and the two thousands. So you're going to have your, your, your anti Romans, you're going to have your pro Daniels, and then you're going to have the attitude era in the middle hoping for the, for the major upset. So I think they've got all bases covered. Um, you know, I just, it, sometimes it can be a little over overkill. And, and I really like that. Um, the only thing I saw different with it, with bringing in Daniel Bryan, we've kind of already had this WrestleMania story with him before, you know, and that's the only thing where I've kind of been like, you know, if it might have been somebody else, I would have popped more. I still popped because I'm a Daniel Bryan fan. I'm an Edge fan, and I'm a big fan of Roman's heel work right now. Mm-hmm. So however it plays out, I'm going to be happy no matter what is how I feel. Um, one thing you did bring up, you brought up Crime Time. Yep. Crime Time had, in my opinion, some of the best vignettes, the most <laughs> memorable vignettes for a tag team I had ever watched. Now, before we talk about those vignettes, when WWF, WWE is known to do something racy, they either 
let the public know ahead of time what they're doing or it's boom, there it is. Mm -hmm. uh, this was one of those, like, you know, when Vince first announced the attitude era, when he announced the change in what was going to be happening on programming, he made an announcement on television. When it came to crime time before these vignettes even aired, WWE.com uh, made a statement on them. Uh, and, and the statement was tonight, a new WWE tag team, Crime Time will be introduced to the Raw audience in an effort to humor and entertain our fans. Tag team known as Crime Time will be doing parodies of, of racial stereotypes. Shad Gaspard and JTG do outlandish, outrageous stunts, ready themselves for tag team action on Raw. This attempt at Saturday Night Live humor is bound to entertain audience of all ethnic diversions. We hope you enjoy the weekly adventures of Crime Time uh, vignettes. Mm -hmm. uh, when that first came out before the vignettes happened, did you know that was going to be? On, no, on until you, until you read that just now, um, that was probably a closed door thing um, without, I was not involved in that. Um, I thought, and so did they at the time when we were doing it, that, you know, or, or, are we going to be okay with this? Is this? And I was like, yeah, boss thinks it's funny. This is what we're going to, we're going to rob a Seven Eleven, and then you're going to climb up into the camera and, you know, give a little shout out to all your homies and your boys and then spray paint the camera because that's what a dumb robber would do. Not that they were. And I said this the other day um, in, a, in another interview, I said, you know, it wasn't meant to be uh, racist or, or anything like that. It was meant to be funny um you know the following week when the guy the white guy was riding his 10 speed under a bridge um you're from new york so you know uh, brooklyn bridge gwb you wouldn't be caught dead underneath though you might be if you are caught you're caught dead under there um who would be riding a 10 speed bike and then here come these two two uh idiots and they and they mug the guy and take his wallet yeah. but he was under he was under the brooklyn bridge yeah. I mean, come on, yeah. you know, uh, we, we, we had the, the best part. I'll never forget it. The best part about it was they were phenomenal workers. Um, but when you're in Ohio Valley wrestling where Cornette was and you come to the big time, sort of like NXT to, to raw SmackDown, you still have to perform on the big stage. And I'll never forget, we were in the arena. And when you're in the, the live arena, like I was mentioning before, we were listening to the crowd and the, and the, and the pop or the, or, the, or, the, uh, or the bathroom break, as I like to call it. They would air these. And the first time we did the 7-Eleven one, they aired it on like the 8.30 mark, somewhere around there. And the ratings, because Vince would get the, the half hour ratings. And the half hour for when they first aired the crime time thing, because everybody was waiting for this, the rating shot up and, and you could see that the, the people stayed watching to see if there was more crime time when they realized there wasn't. And it, it you know, didn't bottom out, but it, you know, we had a, we had a spike when crime time was coming. So he said, move them to nine o'clock. So we went to nine o'clock and here went the spike again. Yo, yo, yo. When the, the spike went up and we got to about the third one, and I'll never forget, he walked up to me in the crowd. You could hear the people laughing and cheering. And you hear some of them, yo, yo, yo. And he looked at me with his coffee. He always had his coffee in his hand. And he said, pal, I hope they can wrestle as good as you make them laugh. And that was it. And that's when I, for lack of a better word, crap myself thinking, oh, man, I know they're good, but they better be good here. because." We've set the bar way high, um, you know, and, and, and they were great. I just think that Vince didn't give a lot of uh, time to tag team wrestling. And that's, that's been uh, historic. He's never really given too much time to tag team wrestling. And it's a shame he's had phenomenal tag teams, you know, dating all, all way, way back. You know, I don't think until he got his hands on, uh, like New Age Outlaws, Road Dog and Billy Gunn, did he start to allow that genre to kind of take hold? And even then, if you ask people like Bully Ray, he only let them go so far. 
um, and he had the Dudleys, he had Edge and Christian, he had the Hardy Boys, he had the New Age Outlaws. I mean, you had tons of tag teams, and I just don't think he ever really gave tag teams that much of a of a of a opportunity. We had Crime Time. Um, you know, there was a ton of tag teams out there. Yeah, and during that time, you know, there was, you know, they they were even feuding with at that time the WWE tag team champions, uh, Trevor Murdoch and Lance Cade. Yeah. Uh, when you were in the company, you know, as the writer, and you know, they're the, you know, they're, you know, they're the wrestlers. Did you ever hear any of the rumors of of Cade and Murdoch spreading rumors that Crime Time was dangerous to work with? No. Um, probably because they, if anything, everyone would try and keep it away from me. Cause I, you know, obviously, uh, when you're working directly with the talent like that, they, the, the, the way the politics works, it works is they would keep it away from you. Um, you know, they would, they would tell, they would tell other people. It never got back to me. So I don't know if the old tell a friend, tell a phone, tell a wrestler, uh, it didn't work in that case, um, to, to, to my knowledge. Okay. Yeah, because uh, JTG did a, an interview with uh, Hannibal TV where it was actually talked about the reason why they were released the first time in 2007, uh, dating back to a house show where Murdoch and Cade were messing with them and changed the finish and the, the ref was in on the rib, but they weren't. Have, did you ever hear this story? Yeah, and, and you know, that happens a lot on house shows. Uh <laughs> we the boys none of the boys really take the house shows that serious um and that's where you're on the road so much you get to have fun sometimes especially um trying to figure out the right way to say this uh minorities need to kind of uh make sure that they're always on top of their game uh, more than the non-minority people and therefore if they if they sometimes they feel they get taken advantage of I guess um, and and the only way you get respect it's almost like being in a prison yard is uh, by pick you know picking a fight with the biggest kid in the yard and and, and knocking them down and that's kind of what happened with Cade and Murdoch and they weren't too pleased with it when they got in the back yeah, because um, JTG talked about that afterwards where um, uh, with him, Barry Windham, John Laurinaitis, and uh, even John Cena, mm-hmm. I guess, you know, locker room leader type deal, um, you know, did the no, 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 you can't do that type deal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I, I do got to add, this is one thing that I, I, I want to ask Um and it, it pertains to, to this WrestleMania with the Warrior Award. Um, we know that Titus O'Neil is winning it. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that Shad gave his life for his son. And a lot of fans on the internet had basically an outcry that they believe Shad should, should win that award. You got to work really closely with these two. Um, do you do you believe that that is the case? And what was it like working with with Crime Time? They were phenomenal. I uh, loved both of them. Uh, they were a, a, as good as uh, or as funny and as fun to be around as when I would be around Road Dog and uh, our Kill, Ron Ron Killens, our Truth, um, you know, and Kevin Nash. Everyone, when you get along, you, you have that just that certain click that you get with somebody. And I, and I had that with them. Obviously we spent a lot of time together. Um, and, and I loved working with both of them. Um, and it's a travesty what happened, um, to Shad, but I think in hindsight, after, um, talking with you, I know you and I talked the other night, Mm -hmm. um, in hindsight, I think there is a method behind the madness to why Shad did not get the Warrior Award this year. Um, no uh, 
I have nothing but great things to say about Titus O'Neill. He, he, he goes above and beyond for uh, the people of Florida and the communities here in Florida. And he does phenomenal work um, and has a beautiful story. He's amazing. Uh, this year, the Hall of Fame is not going to be in front of people. As a matter of fact, it's already been taped. It will air, uh, you know, Tuesday and this, what, Tuesday, I think, as a, you know, but they're doing the 2000 and 2000, uh, 20 and 20. 21 yeah. uh, Hall of Fame inductions together. There's no crowd. There's not even the the TV cameras with the people cheering and the booze and the, and the thumbs up. Um, and that kind of was the special part about the Hall of Fame was when you went there and you um, you got to hear the stories from the legends. You got to hear the stories from some of the current guys, uh, the inductors and the inductees, um, and and especially the special stories of of each. Uh, award winner for the warrior award their story is is extremely special as well and i think next year when we go to dallas and it's in front of a full capacity crowd uh that's when you're gonna see shad get the warrior award i think they want it it, it would it would not do him justice to not receive or for his family not to receive this award in front of the thousands and thousands of people that can appreciate it, that love him, and uh, why he deserves it, um, you can't. You're not going to get that this year. Um, yeah. When the NWO goes in, or when Titus gives his acceptance speech for the Warrior Award, you're all going to watch it from TV, and he's not going to know whether you like it. Or whether you don't like it and and there's pros and cons to that too for the people who wanted shad to get it this year they may throw things at the tv or turn it off or fast forward or whatever for those that don't care and just want to embrace the hall of fame for what it is then they'll watch it too but i truly think that next year will be the year he gets in so that it can be in front of uh, whatever the Mavericks arena holds, 40,000, 30,000, um, you know, because I think that's where they're going to do the, the, the arena portions of the of the shows, you know, and obviously they're in AT&T Stadium for WrestleMania. So, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, and think about this, too. When WrestleMania next year airs in Dallas and you have 100 plus thousand people packed into AT&T Stadium, what is that roar going to sound like? Oh my God! Yeah. When he, when, when whoever accepts the award for him comes out to his name, they, it's it the roof, and in Jerry World, and there is a roof on it will blow off the building, and rightfully yeah. so, rightfully yeah. so. And yeah. I think that's and I and I truly, um, in my heart of hearts, I truly believe that's why everything happened the way it did this year. Um, you know, did he deserve it? Absolutely, no question about it. But no one's going to be there to appreciate it. So next year, 100,000, 100 plus thousand people in AT&T Stadium, 40,000 inside uh, Dallas Mavericks Arena. They're going to they're going to really show their appreciation uh, for 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 Shad. Yeah. And I, I really hope that, you know, when they in the in the arena, when they have the you know, the Hall of Famers line up and everything, I hope whoever is there to represent it for Shad they have that person be the last one because that's going to be such a huge roar from the crowd and that chant whether they're chanting thank you shad or or just shad or crime time whatever they cheer yeah that's going to go on for i think longer than wwe is going to expect it to oh yeah you know oh, they're going yeah. to have their work to to calm that crowd down from that and here's so, and here's the storyline writer in me. Here's the, 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 the wheels always turning um, from a TV perspective and from a fan perspective and from an everything perspective. What if his son accepts the award? Uh, you, you're, you, one, though, there won't be a dry eye in the house. Everyone, you know, everyone's going to be cheering, but everyone's going to be crying. They're going to be happy and they're going to be, it's going to be, a, that would be, a huge bag of mixed emotions. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and uh, I, I fr from your standpoint as a writer and everything that doesn't get any better. I feel like, 
Well, and, and let's be honest, the Hall of Fame, just like everything else around WrestleMania season, is, is all about TV, money, ad dollars, uh, fans, attendance, everything. You yeah. know, it, it's got to it's gotta pop. It's got to sizzle. Um, uh, when, that, when the young little boy, and his name is escaping me, um, the Connor, Connor the Crusher, Mm-hmm. first when they first gave the warrior award to connor the crusher it was the same kind of thing because everyone uh, uh caught on to the story of daniel bryan and, and connor yeah. this is this is going to be even bigger and and you know if 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 his son is i and I, I can't imagine why he wouldn't want to but um you know when he accepts that award, that's, that's just going to blow the roof off, off of both buildings, both yeah. buildings. Yeah. Do, you better do that hall of fame. And if, and if anybody in WWE is listening, you better do that hall of fame introduction at WrestleMania very early, do it after a, a, a go to the bathroom match because you do it right before the main event and you're going to lose the, the crowd is going to be so deflated after getting so high from emotion that that next match is going to be, uh, and, it, and it could be a 10 star match, but you're just going to naturally be on a lull. So if you're coming off of a lull match or you're coming off of a high match and you, and you bring them out and you do the hall of fame thing and then go into a lull match, at least you'll have that 20, 25 minute, marker where the the crowd can settle down settle back down go to the bathroom if they need to grab a pretzel grab a hot dog grab a beer and then get ready for the main event um that's you know because it's going to be too emotional it's going to be phenomenal and and uh you know if undertaker goes in next year you're gonna have shad you're gonna have taker it's gonna be just ridiculous just ridiculous yeah it'll It'll be a, 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 a that'll be a big weekend with that. Yeah, just those two names like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and one of the things you you said during all that you brought up uh, clicks. Now, having been a writer, WWF, WWE, are there clicks among the wrestlers with writers? Are there clicks amongst writers and writers? Not necessarily writers and writers, because I think everyone is always trying to uh, undercut each other sort of like maybe some of the boys might be um, to get in Vince's ear. Um, Mm -hmm. But writers and and some of the wrestlers clicks, I mean, I don't know if you necessarily call it a click, but um, you know, you definitely have guys that are more friendlier to you than, than others, um, especially if you're responsible for their career, Um, you know, and and that's not to say you would ever want to, not favor somebody because again at the end of the day you're the head coach they're the player um you know the head coach is going to get fired before the player uh always does always has always will so you know but there were certainly there were definitely guys that 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 i got along with a hell of a lot better than than others um some people were difficult to work with um you know, and, and as we got more and more closer to the, uh, the the scripts and the memorizing word for word, everything, it just became hard and horrible to deal with because I'm not a memorizing person. Uh, you know, I wasn't like that in school. And I, and I can't ask somebody to do something that I can't do myself. So that made it very difficult. Um, And we're in a day and age now where you get to the building at 12 o'clock and you get handed almost like a manuscript that, you know, for some of these guys that have multiple spots in the night, they got to memorize multiple spots in the night. Not easy to do. It's not just, you know, you and I are going to go out, you know, during the bell and, and we'll call it in the ring. And that's another thing, too, that they don't do anymore is they don't call anything in the ring. So. You know, I'll, I'll never forget, we were on a show and somebody wanted, whoever was working with Road Dog, and, and I can't remember who it was. And this is going to sound funny and bad all at the same time. But in the locker room, they came up to him and they said, do you want to go over our match? And he said, sure, uh, we'll lock up. I'll feed to the crowd. You feed to the crowd. You know, we'll powder out. Bah, 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 bah. And this is literally how he's talking. 
And then he says, and then I'll do my little shim shimmy, punch, 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 pump handle slam, up, down, you know, one, two, three. And the guy goes, yeah, well, in the middle of the match, I thought we could start with a headlock, go off the robes, hit the clothes. And he's like, I can't remember what I did last night. You think I'm going to remember all these spots in the ring? Just follow my lead and we'll be fine. You know, nowadays, you literally are going, Matt, move one, headlock, move two, shoot off the ropes, move three, hip toss, move four. I mean, Macho Man, God rest his soul, he would have been phenomenal in today's wrestling because he would write a book on, on the match that he was responsible for. And if he, he was an agent today, my God, these guys and girls wouldn't know what the heck to do because he would come to work with 35 books and say, all right, Charlotte, here's yours. Roman, here's yours. And, and these guys would be looking at these encyclopedias going, what am I going to do with this? That's just tonight. Wait till tomorrow comes. I mean, and, and, you know, but that's, that's the day and age we're in. Yeah. Wow. And um, one thing that came out of that to me was um, you and Vince Russo are on the same page when it comes to that, because mm -hmm. uh, he says that the wrestlers are now, and, and he also plays said that this has to do with video games. They're so more focused about what they have to do in the ring than what they have to say on a microphone now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the sad part is the microphone is what sells the, uh, the match. The microphone yeah. is what sells the fight. Um, you know, Hulk Hogan didn't have many moves in his arsenal, uh, yeah. but Hulk Hogan has stood the test of time because he brought you in with his words, whether you loved them or you hated them. Uh, you know, you either were taking the vitamins and saying your prayers or you were taking some other kind of vitamins and praying that somebody was going to kill him. Um, yeah. you know, but he, he brought you in Roddy Piper brought you in, um, you know, John Cena brought you in road dog brought you in the rock, Steve Austin. They brought you in. They could talk Brett, the Hitman Hart. He could talk, um, you know, forget about what they could do in the ring because the wrestling is the wrestling. But if no one in, entices you to turn on the TV or pop by the pay-per-view, then rock and Austin could have, uh, you know, a 10 star match at three different WrestleManias and no one would know about it. So, you know, they brought you in They're They're talking and everything brought you in. I think what NXT just recently did with their vignettes. Now they didn't do it in the ring. They didn't do it live and they probably taped it 85 different times. But if you watched NXT last Wednesday, leading into what's coming up this week for the pay-per-views, they really brought you in, you know, with with Karrion Cross. I love Karrion Cross so much. I love Finn Balor, uh, 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 Adam Cole, uh, and the Adam Cole storyline actually played out in Ring of Honor. Um, and if they get to do half of what they did in Ring of Honor, fantastic! It, I know, I know, and people just got to go on YouTube for people who have no clue because I'm sure there are fans that only watch WWE, YouTube. <laughs> The Adam Cole feuds, um, you know, with with Kyle O'Reilly and, and those guys. And because they weren't always a, they weren't always a group. Spoiler alert. They weren't always a group. They fought each other and they fought each other really hard and really well. Oh, yeah. They were really good at what they did. They still are. But I'm saying they were really good over there when they when when the handcuffs were off. And NXT doesn't really have too many handcuffs. Um, and I think that's what makes NXT as good as it is. I say it all the time. I think that's the, the, the number one show. Um, and that's a, a testament to Triple H, Road Dog, Shawn Michaels, uh, William Regal, and all the, the guys over there who are behind the scenes making that happen. Yeah, I, I, not to knock on any product, I love all wrestling. Absolutely. NXT, in my opinion, does for whatever reasoning, what are it behind the scenes or it's the talent themselves or, or it's a mix of everything or it, you know, the atmosphere is different than the main roster. NXT can put on a better program than the main roster. I feel like sometimes. Well, yeah. And I was talking about this with guys the other day and I said, you know, there's, there's, there's someone asked me, why do you think NXT doesn't get to perform on WrestleMania. Shouldn't they get one match? 
shouldn't they get something at WrestleMania? And I said, let's turn the, the, the shoe around for a minute. If you were the wrestlers on either the Saturday night show or the Sunday night show of WrestleMania, would you want any of those guys to be have a match on the show when you would have to potentially follow that? What if you were Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley, who I think is going to have a phenomenal match? You don't want to follow Karrion Cross and Finn Balor. Um, if you're Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair, you don't want to follow. And it probably would have to be one of the guys on, on the card. So you, again, I'll go back to, you don't want to follow Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly. You don't want to follow Karrion Cross and Finn Balor. So let's, so that's why NXT kind of has to have their own nights is because everyone at NXT tries to one up each other. And that's used to be that was what it was like back in the day with rock and Austin and, and DX and, and the Dudleys, they all would be like, Oh yeah, you're opening. Okay. Let's see what you got. And the opening match would put on a phenomenal show. And then they'd come back through the curtain and go follow that. And then the second match would go and they'd come back, follow that. And by the time you got to the main event, man, you had a lot of following to do and a lot of work ahead of you. And I think that's the, and, and again, that's a tribute to the guys who are behind the scenes at NXT. I think they, they push that and they focus on that is, is the follow me attitude, you know? Uh, and, and I think, and this is the other problem with WrestleMania. I think if you treated WrestleMania sort of like professional sports mm -hmm. and in professional sports, whether it's baseball, football, hockey, basketball, we have playoffs, only the best teams get into the playoffs. And then from the best teams, we whittle it down to the championship. Well, we don't start the football season and say all 32 teams are in the playoffs or all 32 basketball teams or baseball teams. Everybody doesn't make the playoffs. Everybody shouldn't make WrestleMania. It should be for the cream of the crop, the best of the best. And that's where, you know, going back to what we were talking about before, I think the inserting of Daniel Bryan is just let's see how many guys we could get in there. Let's see how many people we could shove in here. Why is Sean, uh, Shane McMahon fighting Braun Strowman? And why does Braun Strowman not have any oomph? Like, I don't want to see Braun Strowman beat up Shane. I kind of want to see Shane beat up Braun because Braun ha just hasn't come off with any. A six foot eight, 350 pound guy shouldn't come across as someone who's getting Nickelodeon slimed on and hit with a hollow camera. I'm confused. And going back to where Vince always said, don't insult my intelligence or the wrestling fans intelligence is getting insulted. They're, we're going back to that because that's kind of insulting. So, you know, um, and that's just one of the matches. The other thing I noticed today, and, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to take too much on this, but think about this for a second. Daniel Bryan, Edge, and, and Roman Reigns are in a triple threat match. So correct me if I'm wrong. That means there's no disqualification, correct? Because you can't really disqualify somebody. Yeah. So when Daniel Bryan locks in the, 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 the yes lock. Yeah. And I saw this, if you go back and watch SmackDown, the way he puts it in, his fingers are right around Roman Reigns' mouth. Why not? Bite the holy hell out of his thumb, snap it in half, have him come up with his thumb limping, and he's crying to poor Brie Bella, and then boom, you Superman punch him, and you're out. Or, and same thing for Edge. If he locks a yes lock on Edge, bite his damn hand. But nobody ever does anything like that. But that takes the, you know, the mystique out of everything. Just little things that I notice. Little things. Vince would love Yeah, that. you know, I'm glad you noticed that, because like, I, and when you brought up uh, Lashley, uh, Drew, and Strowman, I just said this the other day to a buddy of mine. They're like three of the biggest men right now in WWE. If Vince likes monsters, they need to be treated like monsters. Then mm -hmm. they shouldn't, you know, and right now out of those three Strowman's being made to look like, in my opinion, the weaker of the three. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's just, those men should be dominating each other. And I even said that match, I know Drew and Bobby are going to put on a fantastic match, but for, for the, the, the size of the three of them, throw Braun in. Braun should be some, mm -hmm. some sort of potential play, some sort of aspect in that match. But um, I, I, I was, I was with you. I don't understand why Shane and him, but 
it is what it is. I mean, it, it's it's it's. I know why they're doing it. They're doing it because Shane every year has to have something to jump off of. Yeah. Um. You know, but now we're in a steel cage, so that kind of means Kevin Owens is going to jump off the pirate ship. Um, unless we figure out, and again, this would go against all logic. Why would we get out of the steel cage that would end the match? So if we get out of the steel cage for Shane to climb the pirate ship and then jump off the pirate ship or be thrown off the pirate ship for that holy crap moment, that defeats the purpose of the steel cage. So, but that's, that's why, you know, that's why that's happening is so that he can climb up to the to Titan Tron and fall off, or he can, you know, he had the thing with the Miz last year where, where, you know, they had a fall 22 stories and, you know, and this year the pirate ship is there and everyone is saying he's going to go off the pirate ship. Someone's going to go off the pirate ship. Well, or yeah. walk the plank of the pirate ship. So, yeah, you know, that's, it's, it's, but again, it's something that isn't necessary for, the 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 show of WrestleMania. Hey, why is Bad Bunny on the show? And if and if Bad Bunny gets gassed running up the ramp after hitting the Miz with a chair, how is he going to go fifteen to twenty with them? I mean, I, well, I mean, there, there's logic for you. I mean, I don't know that. Uh, I certainly didn't tune into wrestling more because of Bad Bunny. So I don't I don't know where the audience is coming from. Um, in the beginning when the talks were and i don't know how big of a star wars fan you are but there was very 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 close uh talks that gina carano who was in the mandalorian yep was going to sign and club charlotte and they were going to go at it at wrestlemania so you would have sasha i'm not charlotte i said charlotte sasha and gina together the two mandalorian stars yeah and after gina were to win the women's title ronda rousey would come out and finally get the match that everyone's been waiting for now i don't know where everything fell apart i don't know if the office kind of fell prey to the political empire um but that was that was on the table so, and it still could be. I'm just saying it didn't happen for WrestleMania, which the Ronda thing was going to lead to SummerSlam. So I don't know, you know, where yeah. where that all fell apart. But wow, yeah, no, that's uh, that's huge. I I never heard that. That's that's big. Instead, we got Bad Bunny. Yeah, <laughs> and he and he hopped around and brought his title to Saturday Night Live. That then he wound up giving to Ron Killings instead yeah, of he, fighting him for it. He just gave yeah. it to him. What a nice yeah. guy. Yeah, what a nice guy. Thank you, Bad Bunny. What yeah, a nice Ron guy. <laughs> Ron gave him a bunch of uh, WWE merchandise from WWE shop.com. I, I remember watching that segment and uh, priest just looks at our truth and goes, so what do you want? And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so earlier, um, you know, we, we were talking about the, the, the writing and everything. How does somebody get, like, how do you get assigned as a writer to wrestlers in WWF, WWE, or is it they just have you working on like a bunch of the script aspects and then say, you know, pull you aside for a special project type deal, like kind of like with crime time? How does that work? Well, you 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 do a lot of grunt work for for a lot of the, the guys that are the main guys um, and you it's all like a brainstorming session um, when it came to crime time. It was more of, I came recommended by a lot of different wrestlers. Um, and Vince kind of was of the notion, oh, he thinks he's a hot shot or this is the hot shot. I don't remember the exact quote that he used, but it was something to that effect that he said, he said, well, if he thinks he's that good, let's give him crime. to See what he does with the, the new team. Let's see what he comes up with them. And the new team was crime time and, and, you know, we sat around and I watched their stuff in OVW and, and Vince always wanted to laugh. If you can pop Vince, then you're as good as gold. And I remember pitching the idea to him about what we're going to do with that. It all goes back to that seven 11 thing. And, he looked at, he said, why would they spray paint the camera? And I said, because they're stupid robbers. They're not, 
just we're not just robbing the 7-Eleven. We're stupid robbers. And it sort of was like the hand thing that you'd had with Mark Henry. And nobody understood why May Young gave birth to a hand. And he's like, and Vince's excuse and Vince's explanation was, but it's a hand. <laughs> we don't get it. How did she crap out a hand, Vince? But it's a hand. And I said, but they're stupid robbers. And he sat back and, ha, 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 ha. Oh, it's either going to do really well or shit the bed. And away we went. Away we went. So. Okay. Yeah. So, like, um, so, like, when you were working with Crime Time, uh, were you also working on other with other wrestlers and stuff like that. I worked, I worked a lot with ideas for the women. Um, I, I didn't have hands in their matches, um, but, but I had ideas and that those were, like I said, they would be more, you know, brainstorming things. Um, a lot of times when you saw a lot of different photo shoots and things like that and ideas for photo shoots, um, some of those came from me. Um, so it really would just depend on, you know, the, the situation. My, my, the highlight of, of being up there was, was working with crime time. Um, and, and I, even when I was there, like when, when road dog was there, right. As he was leaving, um, you know, I really didn't have a hand in everything right then. I was just trying to get my feet wet and the boys would kind of come to me and say, well, what would you do in this situation? Or what would you do here? And we would talk, you know, whether we were in a hotel room or on the road or in a bar or whatever the case was. And they then would, if they liked or they grasped what I was saying, they then would go to whoever their agent was or directly to Vince and say, hey, why don't I try this? Or, hey, can we do this? And I, as that started to funnel, that's kind of how I got that, that rise was it wasn't necessarily working with talent under Vince, it was more sitting with the boys that I got along with and said, why don't you ever try this? Or why don't you do this? And, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, we, we, Brian and road, AKA road dog and Ronnie would sit around with me in Orlando when they were at TNA and we would just bounce stuff off the walls all the time. And, they would then be like, take that to Jeff, take this to Jeff, take this to Jeff. And then it would be my job to go to the L house, which was right across from Universal Studios, Miller's L house. And Jeff would be sitting there with Scott Demore, and he'd be sitting there with Jeremy Borash. And, uh, and sometimes Don West would be there because believe it or not, Don West was a booker for them. Um, and I don't know how he got that job, but anyways, cause he was a home shopping network guy. Um, but, but then I would come in and they, and Jeff, I always loved Jeff. Jeff would smile. He would smile and go, here he comes, here he comes. And I'd come walking over with my drink and I'd buy shots to the table. And Jeff would say, all right, so what did they tell you to pitch now? All right, picture it. And then they all would just they all would just stop and laugh. And, and, you know, like Jeff Jarrett always loved it. Cause I always say, okay, picture it. And, and he would be like, one day I want you to come here and say, picture it Sicily, 1983. And similar to the golden girls. And, and I, you know, I didn't get it at the time. My ex-wife did. She was like, he's making fun of you for the golden girls. And I was like, Oh, I just was going off what road dog said, but anyways, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, and, and, but that's all ribs that the boys were having and things we would do, but yeah, that's how, I mean, it's all a lot of it is if you get in and make friends with somebody who's who's really got a good following and is and is huge. I was blessed. Road Dog, Kevin Nash, Ron Killens, Jeff Jarrett, uh, you know, uh, Crime Time. But Crime Time, I, I, I got Crime Time because of that influx of all these guys that were huge, you know, and 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 all of those guys always putting me over. That's what that's what made you know, uh, things, things, the wheels move, um, you know, nowadays, God, I don't know what you would have to do because they hire so many, uh, TV writers, you know, Freddie Prince Jr. has hung on to his job because he's still cute to Stephanie. I, 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 he's not good. Um, he was there when I was leaving. I mean, he's the scream actor. He's not, He's not one of the boys, you know, and that's not trying to say that I'm better than him, I, but 
I, I, you know, other than being cute, I don't know what he's got going for him. You know, and he's and <laughs> yeah. he's married to Sarah Michelle Geller, so he must have did something right. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. I just I just started thinking of Buffy the Vampire Slayer when you said her name. So I, I love I, that. I yeah. love that. <laughs> Earlier, when I had asked a question involving your work with Sonny Ono. Uh, mm-hmm. I've always referred to him as the innovator of the selfie as oh yeah w he always had the big Polaroid and the big smile which is on your sweatshirt as you had yep. already brought up that that you uh, you're wearing his hoodie you've been doing work with him with fight TV yep uh, it's been with DDT pro and it's been with uh, Joshi now, and pro wrestling Noah and pro and wrestling, pro wrestling Noah. Yep. Noah yeah um, how did all of that come about? Um, Sonny and, and Mike Weber, who's the, the owner of Fight TV, um, Mike uh, approached Sonny with the idea of uh, Pro Wrestling Noah wanting and DDT, because Pro Wrestling Noah actually owns DDT um, mm-hmm. and, and Tokyo Josh. And they approached Fight TV about bringing their programs to uh, United States television and on Fight TV to get more exposure. Uh, but they needed, they felt they needed an English commentary group, sort of like uh, New Japan had when they first went on Access TV with Jim Ross and guys like that. Uh, but they didn't have a large budget. So they, they reached out to, to um, Mike. Mike reached out to Sonny and Sonny said, I got the guy in mind. He's like, I, I work with him all the time. He's like, I, I know what he can do. Um, and I'll be the color guy and let him do the play by play. And, you know, let me just see if he's cool with it. And he asked me if I wanted to do it. And I said, sure. I mean, you know, if it's anything like what we did in, you know, here in the States, it's, it's not going to be that hard. Um, then we found out that they don't really have run sheets and they kind of fly by the seat of their pants and you don't know who's going over and what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. Um, you know, and I think of Jim Ross all the time. He always says he doesn't want to know what's going to happen because uh, it makes him call it better. I agree with that except for the standpoint of um if if in ddt they have this one guy and he he kind of plays a a off the wall val venus character if you will um and he will pull your pants down and and bite you well when we first saw this and he'll bite other things you know on your body and things like that that's kind of what he does and when we first saw this uh, I was taken back and Sonny says, well, Rob, and we're live on pay-per-view. He says, well, what would you call that move, Rob? You worked in WWE. And I was, uh, okay. Well, even, even using the suck it terminology was not going to help me at this point of view. And that was exactly where his head was. So, uh, you know, but yeah, it's been, it's been phenomenal. We did, we did pro wrestling Noah. Uh, they had a tournament. And the exciting thing about that was uh, they are stiff. They are extremely stiff. And in two of the matches, they got cut short because um, two of the wrestlers actually took kicks to the head and legit got knocked out. out. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I saw that. Legit got knocked out. And I'm waiting for the work. I'm waiting for the, you know, okay, he's selling the injury. So no, the match is over. He's out cold. And we're watching this and I'm like, he's, he's really out. And Sonny's like, I think he's really out. No, like, he's really out. You know, it was, that's, and that was the exciting thing. That's the, that is the exciting thing about watching pro wrestling. Noah is I think new Japan now is, is kind of becoming more Americanized pro wrestling. Noah wants that hard hitting hardcore fan where they're going to give you a good story. They're going to give you good wrestling. Um, and they're going to knock the crap out of you legit for real. Um, you know, the, the, the main event match in that Noah, uh, that Noah pay-per-view that we did the chops, the guy was bleeding in the chest, both of them, they were bleeding from taking the chops. You don't see that in WWE. Um, you know, I mean, I, I never would want to take a chop from anybody. Um, and a lot of the boys never liked taking them, but these guys were doing them and they were busting themselves open the hard way on their chest. So you can only imagine how hard they were getting hit. Yeah. And that's, 
honestly why I love watching the Japanese style of mm-hmm. professional wrestling because it is different and it's not Americanized. I understand what New Japan's trying to do because now they want to cater to the American market. And um, the last I knew, they're trying to get back with a, a TV deal here in the States. And I know like right now they've kind of got like a working relationship with AEW and stuff like that. Um, and, and that's actually one of my questions. Not so much like, you know, we know New Japan with AEW, but um, how do you feel about Dragon Gate working with MLW, who, you know, the owner of that CEO is also another former WWE writer, Kurt Bauer. Yep. Yep. Um, I mean, Dragon Gate, everyone, everyone, uh, it, it never hurts people to work with uh, Japanese companies. Um, Sonny and I have, have tried talking with WWE. Uh, and I know Sonny's talked with AEW about having a relationship with Pro Wrestling Noah. Uh, if you watched AEW programming, you saw uh, Maki Ito, who comes from Tokyo Josh. Um, you know, but they they pick and choose certain people. And if they truly gave some of the hardworking talent of Pro Wrestling Noah and Tokyo Josh and DDT Pro uh, a chance here in the States... There's a girl there. Her name is Aki Saki. And I know Sunny always makes fun of me because I think she is just phenomenal. Not only is she a great worker, but she's gorgeous. Um, she could run rings around three quarters of the, of the women wrestling talent, both in WWE and in, and in AEW, uh, but doesn't get a chance to come to the States. Um, so Kenny Omega, if you're listening, Aki Saki, S-A-K-I, um, that's how you'll find her. And that's who you should be booking, not Maki Ito. But I digress. Um, you know, but that's, yeah, we, we, we've always been trying to get these working relationships. Um, I think WWE now, and I've talked with Sonny about this as well. I think WWE is at the point where they don't need a working relationship. They'll just go out and buy you. And when you're the kid with all the toys in the schoolyard, and in this case, all the money in the, in the, in the land, you don't really care to have a work relationship. If I want Shinsuke Nakamura, I'll go buy him. If I want uh, uh, Asuka, I'll go buy her. You know, I don't need to have a relationship with you where WCW back in the day had a relationship with New Japan that was brokered by Sonny Ono through Eric Bischoff and all of that stuff. Um, you know, it, it, they, a working relationship with companies isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think now, though, the problem these days, and this will come to effect, and you're starting to see it with AEW and, and, and Impact, is Impact, your, company A is always going to want to go over and company B is always going to want to go over and you'll never find synergy. And that was one of the main reasons why WCW and New Japan's deal fell apart is New Japan, we would, the WCW would send the talent over there, but they would send over the Stings and, and the Hogans, but then they would also send over some undercard guys. The undercard guys had no problem putting over the, the New Japan guys, you know, to make them look strong. And obviously the Stings and the Hogans always had to go over only because that was what every fan worldwide recognized with. Um, but when New Japan would send their talent over to, to the States, the bookers, uh, Terry Taylor, uh, Kevin Sullivan, they would have Jericho and Dean Malenko and all these guys go over on, on these top Japanese guys night after night after night it, to the point where Jericho actually went to them and said, this doesn't make sense. This m- match isn't even on TV. Let, let me put this guy over, this, wrestler, this Japanese talent over. And let him go home a hero because he can go home. It'll be reported that this guy beat Chris Jericho. They got so upset with that. Terry Teller wound up getting Jericho and this guy, the opening match on a pay-per-view just so that Jericho had to go over. And they just, you ultimately wind up ruining, ruining relationships with, with companies. There has to be a give and take. And, and let's be honest, it's wrestling. It's not, uh, it's not life and death here. And I'm so glad that you brought that up specifically with New Japan and WCW. Um, when I when I interviewed Vince Russo, one of the questions I had for him was, 
one of the last times New Japan brought anybody over, Vince Russo actually booked Jushin Thunder Liger to drop his IWGP. I can't remember. I think he was a middleweight champion or something like that. Yeah. And he had uh, he had uh, Jushin Thunder Liger drop it to Juventud Guerrera. <laughs> And then later that night, Jushin won it back. Um, when I had I had asked him if you know New Japan knew about it, this and that, and, um, basically he said I didn't care. Your talent's coming here. I'm putting over my talent. Um, how like how how does how does you know from your aspect? How do you feel about someone doing that? And you're the company, but you don't even know what the outcome's going to be. Well, that's that's going to be the problem with why you wouldn't want to have a uh, why you're always going to be cautious about a working relationship with another company. Um, you know, Dragon Gate and MLW. Dragon Gate's not going to want to send you some of their up and coming guys, their top tier guys, if they're constantly going to get uh, you know crapped on. MLW is not going to want to send them then down to Dragon Gate because you don't know what could happen down there. Um, you know, and 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 that goes with any company. Um, you know, recently, uh, Sammy Guevara went to Impact because they had that relationship. And what they proposed to Sammy just to make him look bad, he called Jericho and said, this doesn't make sense. Here's why. Bah, 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 bah. And they told him just to go home. Well, that starts a bad relationship because now we've written him onto TV. Now, what they should have been able to do is kind of work out what well, what do we, what do we really want to do here? And how do we really want to make this work? Um, you know, but they didn't. So, you know, I, again, uh, impact is sending over their main guys, which is the bullet club uh, gallows and Anderson. And they, as long as they stick with Omega, then every, you know, they're just going to beat up on everybody. Um, and, and maybe you just send those guys back to impact and, 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 Omega beats up on everybody over there, but eventually it's going to run dry. It's going to be similar to like the way the NWO was in, in WCW, you know, eventually everyone wanted to be in the NWO because the NWO never lost. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not only never lost, but most of the time they won most of their, even like when they interfered in matches and everything, like they, yeah. you know, they were a dominant force. You just, um, you know, but I like that part of the NWO, but when it started, you know, the split and everything, I think that's when it should have just, that should have been the end of it type deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had the, La the LWO, the Latino world order, then you had the Wolf Pack, then you had the black and uh, the, the black and white, you had everybody. And, and then you watched ECW you had the BWO. I mean, yeah. it just got out of control. Everybody was, you know, you had you NWO, to make a joke. You had NWO in Japan. Yeah. Well, you that's know. where it originated. Yeah. That's where it originated. And whether uh, Eric wants to admit to it, I mean, you can play on semantics, but he took the idea of the invasion from New Japan. So, you know, he just happened to have better players with Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and then and, making Hulk Hogan come back. Yeah. Yeah, and that 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 worked out perfect. I thought it did. It did. You know, but that, that, yeah, no, that that just turned out perfect. Um, it, it's, you know, speaking of, of Japan and everything, and and I, I even I got a little off track here. Um, when it when it comes to the Japanese style of wrestling, and, and you you had just said that like you know if WWE wants somebody, they're just going to buy them. How do you feel like, is that, do you feel that's the case with uh, WWE and, and the Japanese wrestlers? Because they come in and they're super, super hot, you know, like Shinsuke Nakamura and people, you know, people, you know, for whatever reason, WWE would say, no, Shinsuke can't fa face Brock Lesnar. But if you YouTube, he has faced Brock Lesnar, Asuka, who huge over in Japan, when she came to NXT, she was huge. Does WWE not know how to use Japanese wrestlers or do they just say, well, I got them and they're hot. Now I want to cool them down. Yes. I, 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 I don't think it's a matter of WWE not knowing how to use any wrestler. Um, 
I think it's more of they want to buy the hottest things in town, but I don't think they necessarily have an appreciation or a respect for uh, non homegrown talent with the exception of a very, very, very few people. Um, case in point, we, we talked about the art of, of being able to, to cut a promo and talk and sell you into a match and all this stuff. One thing that Asuka and Shinsuke, as phenomenal workers as they are, can't do is they can't talk you into a match because they don't speak English. Now, why don't we have an advocate, if you will, to speak on their behalf like a selfie Sonny Ono kind of guy, not to try and cheap plug push him, but he speaks English better than anybody for, for someone with a second language. He speaks English phenomenal, where you, you're not asking yourself, what did he say? Um, and, and, you know, we've even talked out nowadays, since we got to get into the, the millennium and everything, I, I was going to give him a selfie stick. And it could almost be like a cane like Freddie Blassie had and Mr. Fuji, um, you know, because if he just goes like that with the camera, it's not really going to work too well. But if he had the selfie stick, he could reach across and whack you with the cane and all that stuff. Um, but again, he could be the, the, the mouthpiece for a Shinsuke for an Asuka with all the phenomenal talent they have in NXT, what if Sonny had his own little faction that you never knew where these guys were going to show up, whether it was SmackDown, Raw, or NXT, and he had all of the Japanese talent or all of the foreign talent, if you will. He's managed uh, uh, Mexican wrestlers. Um, you know, he's had Japanese wrestlers. So, you know, and that's just that's just one example. I think it's a matter of if you're not uh, homegrown by them, like John Cena was homegrown, Randy Orton is homegrown, Batista was homegrown, Triple H was homegrown. You very rarely, and you might be able to count on on one, maybe two hands of people who aren't homegrown that they actually really did something decent with. Dudley Boys. AJ Styles, and even that hit and miss. Um, but then you look at Big Show, who never knew whether it was Monday or Friday, whether he was a heel or a face. Um, I think the guy had 38 changes in, in, in a month, one time. Uh, you know, guys like that. Um, even, even to the point, if you, if you take a look at this, Everyone that he pulls in, that Vince pulls in from the outside, he has to tweak something about you. Um, you know, Ric Flair had to have Bobby Heenan, um, you know, and he was the real world's champion. They, they had to tweak something, always tweaking something, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, I, Bully Ray said it best once. He said, um, you know, Vince is sort of like God. God created man in his image and likeness. And that's what Vince has to do. And if Vince can't create you in his image and likeness, then he really has no use for you. You're just a, a you know, a, a pawn in the game. Um, so I don't think it's a matter of them not knowing how to book the talent or how to use the talent. I, I think it's just a matter of Shinsuke's hot. He's the hottest thing. We don't want anybody else to get him. Let's buy him. And we'll figure out what, what we can do with them. The problem also becomes, and, and I said it again, not to be repetitive, but once you get him here, if he can't speak English, you know, then, then we, got a, we got an even bigger problem because now you're 0 for 2. At least when we went out and we took AJ Styles from New Japan because he was in New Japan after leaving Impact, AJ can speak English. AJ can cut a promo. AJ's been up and down, knows what he's doing. So... You know, then it just becomes, then he's got the other problem against him. Then it becomes, well, you're too small. I mean, there's always going to be something that Vince is going to say ain't going to work. You know, and the whole suspend disbelief thing, I don't think Vince really buys into that all the time. You know, I, he may yeah. be buying into it now with having Shane beat up on Braun. But other than that, I don't think he buys into it all too much. Yeah. Uh, Rob, I want you to take this time uh to to 
plug anything you have going on that's going to be coming up, whether it, you know, fight TV or any side projects, uh, take, take this time to, uh, to, to plug anything that you got going on. Well, I mean, as always, you'll catch me on Fight TV doing uh, DDT Pro, Tokyo Josh, as well as uh, Pro Wrestling Noah. Uh, they actually have a new company coming out called Gleet, G-L-E-A-T. Um, and, and you'll see uh, the great Muda uh, fighting on there. So, um, and Kaz Hayashi is the, uh, is the owner. Um, so they've got upcoming action, huge, huge battles. Um, uh, and they're actually going to be, uh, airing on fight TV and Sonny and I are going to be doing the, the color commentary and the broadcasting for that. Um, so definitely look for that in 2021. Um, and other than that, you can always catch me on Twitter at Rob Hockman, H O C H not with a K M A N. Um, and I'm always on Facebook, uh, and Instagram rescuing dogs and having fun i i do a lot of i do a lot of uh dog rescuing here in florida um i've got 12 dogs uh a rescue pig i've got all sorts of different things in the in the zoo in the in the hockman zoo if you will so we've got we've got a whole ton of animals and and obviously i'm, I'm never too far from the sports memorabilia um so yeah i mean that's I, i'm all over the place and and i'm i'm most looking forward like I said, to heading down to WrestleCon, if you see me at WrestleCon, if you see me at uh, WrestleStock or WrestleFest, or if you see me at WrestleMania, I'll be in one of the pods out there. Um, you know, stop by, come say hi. And if you see the kid, uh, 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 Quentin, who's going to be with me uh, crying and shedding a tear, maybe buy him a beer or a T-shirt because he's actually going to be experiencing his very first WrestleMania. So unlike, unlike we, we, I know you mentioned before working at Disney, you know, we always talk about at Disney going to the Magic Kingdom and walking through the gates for the first time and seeing it through a child's eyes. <laughs> the sad part is, or the funny thing, it's not actually sad, it's kind of funny and it's going to be enjoyable, is his wife, Erica, uh, my wife and, and myself are going to experience walking through Raymond James Stadium and him seeing WrestleMania for not one night, but two nights for the first time. Um, he's bought probably 35 t-shirts and he's wrestling on a daily basis on which shirt to wear on which day he may actually do like three or four wardrobe changes throughout WrestleCon and and the Kevin Nash party and then WrestleMania day one and WrestleMania day two so um that's gonna be that's gonna be a blast and we're looking forward to that awesome well uh, I hope he has a great experience of this first WrestleMania Rob I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with me today I'd love to have you come back on and share more stories and uh, you know, we can, we can find the time, uh, after mania and, you know, enjoy the show. And, uh, I want to, you know, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And next time I promise next time we do the interview, I'll have my LJN guys behind me, the big rubber guys from back in the eighties. <laughs>